Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Liam Taylor Guitar. I am really excited for today's video because it's something a little bit different and something I've been really looking forward to releasing. Today's video is an interview with YouTube music theorist Corey, better known as 12 Tone. 12 Tone's videos are simple but hugely informative with an instantly recognizable format. I've used them as a learning resource for both myself and for my students. So we're gonna talk about his first musical experiences, his journey towards becoming a YouTube creator, and offer some advice for music creators. Let's begin. To the best of your memory, what was your first musical experience? So the first thing that I think comes to mind is uh, when I was a kid, like very young, we got had this like really nice uh, high-end electric keyboard, electronic keyboard, uh, mm. and I, did, I had no idea how to like play piano. I had never taken lessons. I didn't know what I was doing, but I would sort of sit down and just play effectively random notes. Uh, like I didn't know scales. I didn't know chords. I didn't know which notes went together. And I also didn't know like two-hand independence. I didn't even know that was a thing I was supposed to know. Okay. So I would just like play a couple low notes with my left hand and then play a couple high notes with my right hand and then go back and forth. And I don't know. it. I don't remember how it sounded it probably didn't sound good but it was sort of it was just sitting around experimenting and seeing what noises did what you know sure so just kind of freely experimenting with yeah whatever sounded good yeah at that point we sort of conscious of some things sound bad so i perhaps shouldn't do that this thing sounded good so can i repeat that or was it just the mm. let's make some stupid noises phase i think I'm trying to remember because it's easy to project that backwards, easy to look at it and be like, oh, yeah, clearly totally. I was thinking about these sorts of things. But, you know, I knew what I when was I was doing. five. Yeah. But uh, but no, like, I, I remember like uh, my grandmother would always uh, try and get, go to my parents and be like, you need to get them piano lessons. You need to get them like taking these, mm. learning how to do this. And I was always like, no, I don't want lessons. I don't want to know. I, I, like, that sounds boring. I just want to sit here and pl uh, yeah. play random notes. Uh, so I'd. I think any credit I give myself for thinking about what I was doing is retroactive. But, you know, it's sure. still it is yeah. a sort of free experimentation more so than anything else. That's eerily similar to actually the first thing I started doing, exactly as you say, toy keyboard in the living space, hitting it, making noises. Um, are you familiar with Bob's Burgers? Yes. That's all the cartoon. Yes. Was it... I com I compare my earliest musical experiences to that of Gene Belcher. Is that relatable? Uh, sort of, it, except that, like, in the narrative of the show, it seems like he has some understanding of music and, like, you know, at, at some level, at least. <laughs> I suppose so, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, there's... But, uh, like, we'll sit down and write actual songs, and I, I was not doing that, you know? I, I was That's sitting true. down and playing yeah. random series of notes that you know, were very far away from each other because that was funny. So at what point after that did you realize that your enjoyment of music would involve a whole lot more music theory than other people? Because, I mean, I think about the way I listen to music, it's pretty analytical a lot of the time. Yeah. I'm thinking, I could play that guitar solo better. <laughs> or, um, oh, this is mixed a little weird. Why did they decide to put all of the drum kit in the left ear? You know, yeah. it's analytical, and I, I understand that's not how normies listen to music. <laughs> when did you have a first experience of noticing, oh, actually, I'm thinking about this in a different way to other people? I was actually probably fairly late, I think more in college. Actually, like, honestly, I've when I listen to m music for fun, I try and shut that part of my brain off as much as I can. Mm. Uh, it's I can't shut it off entirely, you know, you get, you get that... Yeah. But like, uh, it's yeah, you get to a point where, like, it's hard for me to sort of sit back and relax if I'm listening to music that like I'm totally. analyzing. Yeah. So I I try and not do that as much as possible, and I try not to listen to. Or I, it's not that I try not to listen to stuff that I can enjoy analyzing, but I try to listen to stuff mm. sort of separate from that when I do. Um, yeah. But like, I think probably around like when I started doing college was when I was like realized like I was starting to take theory classes. I actually like did some programs beforehand and got some background. And so I was able to test out of the first couple levels of theory and then in college. And then I, um, 
like I was doing very well in the class and I was like really enjoying thinking about the structures of what we were learning and it was mm. it was a lot of fun and so that was I think sort of what set me down that path and then as I sort of got further into that I just I really fell in love again with those structures with those ideas uh sort of honestly almost like separate from the music itself like I, I enjoy I enjoy listening to music and like, analyzing music, but I also sort of enjoy thinking about the structures and theory separate from that as its own sort of entity. And I think that sure. sort of really that really came about in college. And what what sort of music were you listening to at the time? Are there any bands that kind of stood out? Either bands that you found it really easy to kind of switch off the analytical part of your brain, or bands that you like couldn't help but analyze in that way uh so i was listening uh to a lot of rob zombie oh yeah uh was one of my favorites ever and one of those people where it's very easy to switch off that at least the at least the theory analytical part of my brain sure. the sort of because i'm also a vocalist yeah and i'm a trained my, my main thing was rock and metal mm. and it's a little harder to turn that off when listening to rob zombie because sure. you know you're thinking about what he's doing with his voice and how he's layering things but like just just sort of like if if you look at like Dragula, the main riff is like two notes a half step apart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's not it's not like there's a lot of oh, actually there. That's not fair. There's a lot going on in the arrangement. That's I think where his yeah. his stuff really shines is arrangement, orchestration, like a lot of different layers of sound happening at the same time, and yeah, so you can sort totally. of tune in sort of a thing that I, I like to call sort of orchestral listening, where you sort of isolate and listen to a specific part instead of uh, within a larger piece, which is, yeah. I think, a really useful skill. And I think a thing that a lot of musicians could probably benefit from developing more. Yes. But uh, but I think uh, that that part's a little harder to shut out. But like, just because of, because I've been listening to Rob Zombie since like high school and mm. listening to like that sort of like hard rock and metal and stuff, it's sort of easier to lean back on the emotions that I associate with it from that period of my life yeah. instead of looking at it with the perspective of like a music theorist in their late 20s. So that's, yeah. Wicked. A little bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. What was the journey like from, or even what was the journey from realizing you quite liked music to uploading your first video as 12 Tone? How did that come about? When I started college, I was just getting an associate's for a performance degree so that I could just go and be a rock star. Sure, yeah. And over time, uh, as tends to happen when you try and do that, uh, teachers explained how statistics worked. And they were <laughs> like, look, you just, this is not a viable only career plan. Like, sure, yeah. it'll be great if it happens, but like, have a backup plan. Yeah. And so I like I was like, you know what? I'm I'm really enjoying music theory. I'm enjoying vocal technique stuff. It would be cool to be a teacher. Mm. So I decided after the associates, I was going to do a bachelor's. And over that time, I was also sort of building relationships with teachers at the school. Uh, sorry, that's right. Trying to get them to or and and I had a lot of people who were like uh, recommending me to the head of the vocal department, being like, you should. You should hire this person. I want them in my sub pool. I want them to sub my classes. Mm. Uh, and so I was setting up a lot of recommendations for that. And then about like three months before I graduated, they brought in a new head of the vocal department who decided that they weren't going to be hiring any new, any recent graduates anymore okay, yeah. uh, because they wanted people to sort of get out into the world, which is fair. Mm. Uh, but it's sort of annoying that that policy lasted for about six months, which covered my graduation. Uh, so I yeah. sort of I just like suddenly didn't get the job that I've been setting myself up for for three years mm -hmm. and was just like, okay, well, what do I do now? I have a bunch of free time. I like music theory. Uh, and so I was just, I like educational YouTube. And so I got some friends together to do some of the stuff that I didn't know how to do yet mm. and just started uh, making videos. Brilliant. So in your mind at this, at this moment in time, are you a musician or are you a youtuber if, if you had to choose one yeah <laughs> i mean i think i'm both but uh, well, yeah <laughs> but i think yeah when i i would say that i describe myself as an educational youtuber first hmm. whose domain is music theory more than i describe myself as a music theorist who works in educational video got it is probably like i, like I said i think 
I, it's definitely a lot of both, but I, that's sort of most of my time goes into making videos, producing videos, researching videos, uh, dealing with, you know, social media and everything like that. So I think that that's more accurate to describe myself as working in YouTube as a music theorist rather than working in music theory as a YouTuber. Was there a point having uploaded these first couple of videos that you realized, oh, this is actually taking off, this is getting subscribers and a lot of attention and seems to be helping people? Was there a point where you realized this could actually be a career option? This entire YouTube thing by itself could sustain me? I was aware of the possibility from the beginning. Like, it, it was... I had already, it had already been, YouTube was already fairly old by the time I started doing it. Uh, mm. There were already people like, you know, Minute Physics, Smarter Every Day, who were doing this professionally, Veritasium, not anyone who was doing it in music theory that I knew of, mm. uh, but there were definitely, the idea of being an educational YouTuber as a job was already out there, mm. and so it was, wasn't something that I thought was super realistic, like I was saying with like the rock star thing where you just sort of, you have a backup plan, and I did mm. have one. But like I was, um, I was aware that it could happen, and I think sort of, uh, it took a while to get to a point where like I felt like that was plausible for me. I think that probably the biggest point where that happened was uh, when Adam Neely uh, shouted us out. Uh, that mm. was like that was like a couple year, like a year and a half into this uh, into uh, publishing. And that was sort of pushed us over like 10,000 subscribers. And then okay. about like five or six months later, um, the, um, what's it called? Uh, the Black Hole Sun video uh, mm -hmm. that went, started to go viral. And that was sort of, then we really started to blow up. And then a lot of our older videos were getting watched and those started to blow up as well. Mm -hmm. And then we got featured on like YouTube's creator on the rise on the trending page. Cool, and so yeah. that was really the moment where I was just like, oh, this is, this is something. And that was the moment that I decided that I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I have to try doing this full time. I have to like quit my tutoring job and just focus on this and see what happens. And so that was, I think, the point where it really became like separate from like, this is a thing that could happen or this is a thing that might happen to me. It was a thing that like, I want this to happen to me and I think I can make it happen for me. And that cool. was, I think, the big uh, turning point. And it's interesting you mentioned the Adam Neely shout out because I think that is actually where... I came across your channel through Adam <laughs> Neely, so oh, nice. it's interesting that it wasn't just me. Nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that links to the next question, interestingly, as well, because I've noticed there's some weird uh, synchronicity between some of the uh, uh, music theory channels on YouTube, um, like 8-Bit Music Theory, Adam Neely, yeah. Rick Beato, and I think the one that really sticks out in my head was um, recently you had a video about the 5-4 Clave, and I think just before or just after, Adam Neely had a very similar video, which I think mentioned the 5-4 clave as well. But his was more generally about playing in 5-4. I'm just wondering if there's any other moments of synchronicity. Uh, are these planned? Do you have a secret YouTube music theory <laughs> forum where you decide how you're going to screw with the fans by releasing similar content? Or is it... I mean, it's not, it's not planned. I can tell you that much. But, uh, but we do... We do all like know each other. We have um, back, like, back like Twitter uh, DMs and stuff that we chat through. We have emails, uh, like I, or some more than others. Obviously, like I, sure. there's people that I talk to a lot, like Adam and and others who I don't really talk to as much. But like uh, for the most part, sometimes sometimes I do notice some synchronicity. Uh, like I did a video on experimental music on uh, Friday. And then, then when I talked about 433, and then the Monday afterwards, Adam put out a video about 433. Nice. Which, I mean, there's no way he could have produced that video in that time. Yeah. Like, that was, he was working on that beforehand. I, that's not an accusation. <laughs> but, like, uh, it's just that that was one that I, I specifically remember because he commented on the video when I put it out. It was like, oh, hey, I'm actually putting out a video on 433 in, like, two days. Interesting. So, three days. But, uh, but so, it does happen sometimes. It's sort of... I actually haven't noticed it much, partly because I think a lot of us have our own sort of areas of interest and like mm. focuses. Like, <clears throat> I mean, if I if I never make a video about video game music, I will almost certainly never step on eight bits toes. Yeah, like totally. it just won't happen. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. so so those sorts of 
because he has that specific niche and that specific interest that he wants to talk about, uh, I don't really overlap with him. The one I tend to, and not worry about, the one I tend to sort of intersect with most is probably Rick, uh, Rick Beato okay. because he also does song analysis. Right. Uh, yeah. And I don't, I don't tend to watch a lot of his videos, partly just because he puts out so many that it's yes. just it's too many to, for me to it's keep hard up to with. Keep up with, yeah. But like, <laughs> but like, I'm also not super worried if we put out videos about the same song because he and I analyze music very differently. Mm. And so, if you watch his analysis videos, the way he talks about music, the way he thinks about music, the, the things he focuses on are very different from what I would do. Mm. So even if we do analyze the exact same song we're going to make very different videos. Yeah. And so there's been a couple times where I put out videos and people have been like, oh, Rick covered this. And I was, that's never really worried me because I was just like, if I go watch Rick's video, it's not going to be about the things I talked about. It's going to yeah. be about the things Rick wants to talk about. And yeah, that's, yeah. so, I mean, sometimes very rarely you'll have these things where we do almost exactly the same thing and we just haven't seen each other's videos and that's mm. always awkward. But like, for the most part, especially because a lot of us also we're aware of each other. We watch each other's work. So a lot of time it's pretty easy to just like shout out someone's video and use that for that material and then build off it. Mm. Like actually a long time ago, I did a video about Conlon and Caro uh, oh, yeah. and Adam Neely had already done a, vid done a video about him. So I'm, I don't really like delving into like histories and biographies. That's, uh, that's not super my interest. Mm. So I figured uh, Adam already had, so I would just say, like, hey, go watch Adam's video and then come here so I can talk about theory. And right, obviously yeah. Adam talked about theory, too, but he sort of talked about the whole the dude's life and everything he did. Yeah. And I was just like, I want to talk about what he did with player pianos. I want to yeah. talk about the specific mathematics of that. That's mm. what's interesting to me. So I sort of used Adam's video to circumvent the part I didn't really want to talk about anyway. Interesting. That's a cool way of doing it. Yeah, and it's it, it is pretty apparent that you guys have very different um areas of expertise. I always think Rick Beato's more about uh the production and the sense of ensemble and how individuals play together. Um Adam seems to be especially recently more about live performance, um and you seem to be more about the actual the compositional aspects of music. So it's nice that yeah. even if you were to talk about exactly the same subject, as you say, you would focus on different elements of it. So you mentioned earlier on that you had, uh, when you first started creating videos, you uh, sort of recruited help of a few different people to make the content. Is Do you still rely yeah. on a team, or is it a one-man one man army situation at the moment? So it's mostly me. I, um, I do the... I mean, I do the narration, I do the audio editing, I do the script writing and research, I do the mm. uh, film editing, I do the drawing. Uh, I do have one other person who works with me, uh, my sibling, who does like uh, script review and make sure that it's sort of accessible from Got a non-music theorist perspective and also just get another set of eyes on it. Yeah. And they also help me sort of decide what I'm going to draw sometimes because occasionally I'll get to a point where it's like, uh, I'll be going through and be like, how do I represent the abstract concept of melancholy? <laughs> and it's just like, what do I, what do I draw that I like mean, frowny face? So just, surely. Yeah. I went with Eeyore, but <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. I suppose. I was. But yeah. Yeah. So the, the same sort of, just sort of, I'll get to a point in the script where I'll just like, I'll just give up and just put doodle on the theme of whatever. And then I'll go through it with them and we'll figure out what we want to do. And they also sort of, while we're filming, will uh, sit across from me because I'm sitting directly under the camera. Yeah. So I can't really see the screen. Okay, so yeah. they are the, they sort of, they're watching that to make sure that um, the shot is lined up, the paper doesn't drift too far Got off it. angle. Uh, and so everything is in the shot, the lines are right. Uh, so that's, but beyond that, it's, it's mostly me. Could you walk us through the process of doing a video? So the, from the moment of, ooh, this could be something really cool to talk about to the hitting live or hitting schedule on YouTube. And the thing I'm really interested in is how you go about research in particular. Yeah, so research, um, mostly, honestly, like, depending on, it depends whether I have an idea already or I'm looking for an idea. Sure. But basically, the, the basic process, I usually start on Wikipedia, honestly. Like, that's mm. not my final source. But it's it's a great way to quickly get a list of like what I need to Google, whose names I should be looking up, what yeah. sort of primary sources I should be uh, looking for, and on some stuff like if I'm talking about like the structure of a scale, I can use Wikipedia, I can use random people's blogs because 
it's just it's uh subjective and mm. consensus driven anyway so i get to as an expert i get to decide if this stuff is true sure in a way yeah. uh not you know true but you know uh but uh, so i can use those sort of weaker sources but if i'm talking about history if i'm doing like this week i actually like I'm talking a bit about like Hugo Riemann's model of functional harmony. Okay. And so I went and looked up like an English translation of, uh, I don't remember the German name. The English name is Harmony Simplified, right. which is sort of the, the text where he introduced the idea. And it's, I mean, it's not very well written, but like I had to like read through that to make sure I really understood not what anyone else said he was saying, but what he said he was saying. Right. Yeah. And trying to... So when, when I'm doing history stuff, when I'm doing like specific models about like how specific people described ideas, I do try and go deep and find primary sources as much as possible. And if I can't, I will look for like the sources that I trust that are talking about this. Like um, Music Theory Online is a good one if I can find papers on there. Uh, that's the online journal of the uh, Society for Music Theory. Mm. Uh, and they have, they have a lot of great stuff. Um, there's a site called Tonal Soft that has oh, yeah. a bunch of articles, especially about tuning stuff that I'll often rely on if I'm talking about those sorts of things. And then I'll sort of, like I said, I'll try and find uh, sources that I trust. And part of it is just like trying to take the expertise I already have and project it onto whatever I'm looking at. And mm -hmm. like, cause that makes it, you know, easier to quickly absorb. I think that's a lot of what makes me good at my job and what my job is, is like quickly processing new information more yeah. than like already knowing all of this stuff. Yeah. Totally. So I'm trying to think through like, yeah, I think that the big stuff is digging up primary sources when possible, uh, using Wikipedia and like blog posts as a way to figure out which names to look up. Mm. And again, if it's, if it's like soft stuff, like, like, uh, structural theory stuff that like, I can decide whether it's good or not, whether it's true or not in a meaningful way. Mm. Uh, I, I can just use those sources, but like if it's, if it's like a specific historical thing, I have to go find something better than Wikipedia because yeah. I mean, honestly, Wikipedia is pretty reliable on a lot of this stuff just because it's not controversial. Yeah. So the only people who are going to bother editing the Wikipedia page about this thing are people who know a lot about it. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's not like, you know, when you get into like controversial political stuff, you just you can't trust Wikipedia because yeah. anyone could have put whatever they want there to push whatever agenda. Mm. But when you're trying to figure out, say, who like who proposed Roman numeral analysis first, that's not a thing that like people are fighting about. That's not there's just yeah. they they just they're just going to be people who have very strong opinions about Roman numeral analysis yeah. and have done a lot of research putting stuff there. So that's that's safer. Yeah. Uh, and that's how, speaking of that one, uh, I, for that video, which I did sometime last year, I think in March, I wound up having to look up uh, a textbook by Gottfried Weber, who was a early uh, 19th century theorist. Uh, the textbook actually came out, just to, for a sense of scale, it came out before Beethoven had started writing the Ninth Symphony. Okay. And it is... <laughs> It is, a, it's a trip. It's so yeah. much fun. I haven't like gotten to sit down and read the entire thing yet, but it's just like... I love it so much. And whatever I'd like do these sorts of like interviews or talk with anyone, like I always like recommend just like, go, go look up Gottfried Weber, go look up this text. It's just, like, it's kind of like looking through like, um, like do a, like a funhouse mirror, okay. you know, where it's like, it's almost right. And, and not <laughs> right. It's almost recognizable. It's almost yeah. the system I know, but like not quite in a lot of really weird ways Interesting. that you just, you don't really, you don't really know until you sort of get into that perspective. And it was, it was just a lot of fun. And he keeps doing this thing in there where he'll like, he'll say uh, something like he'll, he'll just say something and be like, uh, this is a thing. I can't prove it. I can't explain it, but we're, but it's just true. We're just going to accept it. Let's move on. <laughs> it's just like, from my perspective, like a lot of these things are no longer true in modern music. Right. Yeah. It's so just like, I'm just reading things of like screaming at the page. It's like, no, ask one more question. Dig a little bit deeper. You're so close. But a time uh, before but you anyway, have to that's... cite anything. It sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and that's a bit of a sidetrack, but yeah, so that's, that's sort of my research process. Um, after that is script writing. And I tend to stick to a fairly, fairly strict schedule. So I have, mm. Sort of Sunday is script writing, mm -hmm. uh, and that's at that point I will basically finalize the script. I may go make some changes later if I need to. I try and 
Um, but I try to be basically done and have the whole thing laid out uh, by Sunday evening. Mm. And then uh, and that process, honestly, is mostly... I don't want to say stream of conscience because I'm, of conscience because I'm like I'm thinking about it a lot beforehand as yeah. I'm learning the information I'm structuring it in my head, mm. but for the most part I'll just sit down and write from top to bottom the script and uh, unless there's some major reason to change that structure I will usually just leave it at that. Okay. Um, so that's a lot faster than a lot of people I know write scripts, but oh, it, yeah. it tends to work fairly well. <laughs> Very much. Uh, <laughs> just sort of. A lot of my a lot of my YouTube friends are shocked that I have you know the day that I write the script and there's like that's not it's not like a week long process. They're just like no nah, no it, it works. Uh, Monday is just recording the audio and editing the audio, which is fairly straightforward. You know I just sit here just like this talking to the mic. You know how recording audio works. Sure. And then just edit that all together, cut out all the ums and blank spaces, and add in the musical examples. After that, Tuesday is when we film, and so. The thing, the thing with that that I have to do first for most of Tuesday is sort of work out the animation directions where I'll just I'll listen to the audio, uh, decide what I'm, what for each like two to three second chunk of audio I'm going to be drawing. Mm. And then I'll just put that in a list. And then when I'm, we're filming, we're just going down that list one at a time. And uh, just also one thing, because I've had some people ask me this before, I don't actually like lay out where stuff is on the page in advance. I okay. just, when I'm writing the directions, I'll put in things, markers like now would be a good time to new page if I need to. And right. then I'll just go through until I, you know, hit one of those at a time where I need to and just switch over. So that's, it's a much more chaotic process than a lot of people I yeah. ta have talked to assume. So, but it, you know, it works. It, it, you get, you get stuff fitting and just as long as I'm conscious of it and looking ahead to like, do I have room to make it to the next one? And then I don't get stranded. In yeah. the middle, so that that's, but uh, after that is editing, which is just taking that again, cutting out all the blank bits, and then each uh, drawing is a separate clip, effectively. Mm. So I'll cut that, like go through the audio, count out how many, or not count, but calculate how many frames I need from the beginning of the audio to where I want my hand to start pulling away, mm. and then I'll just shorten it to that and slide everything over, okay. and so that's. It's a, it's a bit of a time-consuming process, yeah. but it's you know it gets gets it looking I think very very smooth. So mm. it's, it's different to actually how I imagined it in my head. There's your as, as you said your script writing process is so condensed, but then the editing process yeah. in my mind it was just like oh yeah he records it and then he speeds it up. Uh, there's a lot more <laughs> in the edit evidently, so it's yeah. interesting that it's kind of flipped to how I was imagining yeah. it myself. That's interesting. When we started, that was sort of my idea as well. Is like yeah. I'm just gonna like take the audio, record it, slow it down about fifty percent, just film, and then we'll speed it up by two hundred percent, and it'll yep. be fine. <laughs> and then you start to do that, and you realize that you can't. If you have something that like is two seconds long, you only have four seconds to record the uh, to draw. And yep. so th there's a lot of there's a lot of variation in terms of how much time you need to draw different things relative to the. So it's like. It was definitely how I thought it was going to work before I started to, but it just, we even tried when we were doing uh, notation, because I was like, we want this to be the same speed throughout, so we're just going to do that to a really slow metronome, mm. and even that, just like, it takes so much less time to like draw certain notes than it does to draw others, sure. that it just sort of, you wind up getting, getting really chaotic with that too, so each, nowadays, like in the notation, each individual note is a separate clip that has been sped up to match whatever the tempo is. Sure. So you you may be going from like a really fast to really slow within that handwriting, but like in my experience, once you get past a certain point of, of speed, which is about three to four hundred percent in my experience, you just like you can't tell the difference anymore. Mm. Like you can't tell the difference between like five hundred percent and five thousand percent very easily. Sure. They look yeah. basically the same. So it's a lot lot more lot more leeway than a lot of people might imagine I have. But interesting. Cool. So last question. What is one piece of advice to someone that who either wants to do what you're doing or who wants to work in any any of the fields of music? What is one piece of advice you could give that person that is specific to you and your experience? So if you ask someone else, they would get a different answer completely relies on your background. So the first thing that comes to mind is that more technical is not the same as better. Mm -hmm. I think that's like, I think 
a founding principle of sort of how I approach a lot of what I do. And even like when I'm writing music, like I know a lot of really complicated things and then I'll go compose music like Rob Zombie and I'll go sure. like do, do simple things because that's what sounds good to me. Mm. And just, I think that that's, there's this, uh, there's this tendency when you learn to do a lot of things to use those things mm. and you sort of, because it's like, oh, I know how to do tritone substitutions. Oh, I know how to like modulate with a diminished seventh chord. Oh, I know how to do like, I don't know, contrapuntal voice leading in like every section of my song. And it's just like, you don't, you don't need that. You can mm. do what you, you, you can do much more simple things. And I think a lot of, a lot of the point of theory and a lot of the point of, from a, sorry, I don't tend to think theory is primarily about composition in the first place, but when it comes sure. to composition, I think the point of theory is uh, just to allow you to bring out the ideas that are already there okay. and to sort of fill gaps in creativity more than to show off how many cool things you can do at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because most listeners aren't trained to listen to the sort of like hyper complex, like post tonal whatever's that like people like me obsess over mm. and even like me honestly like again it's not what i listen to for fun even it's what i listen to for work sometimes sure. but like i'm much more interested in what they're doing like from a structural perspective than i am in actually like listening to it mm. and so i think recognizing that good can be simple and often simple is better not necessarily better better is not fair but mm. like that so there's this there's this phrase that's coming to mind that's like sort of often used for like teaching advice mm. uh but i think sort of applies here too which is um uh make it as simple as you can and no simpler mm. which i think uh just sort of recognize where complexity is helping sure but don't don't assume that it will yeah i guess it would be I like also, it. actually, if I can do, yeah, if I can do one other as well, uh, yeah, sort sure. of uh, unrelated, but more on a, the career side of things, uh, especially if you're trying to do like YouTube, but also a lot of this applies if you're trying to do like performance or whatever anyway, is that you can't wait until it's paying you like a job to treat mm. it like a job. Yeah, 100%. I think that that's because you, you really, you have to build that sort of audience respect before mm. money will start coming in, but you will never actually build that unless you are putting in the sort of work and the sort of effort and the sort of consistency that it takes yeah. to perform at that level. Yeah. You have to prove that you, which that's not necessarily the best system. Like it would be mm. maybe nice if that wasn't how it worked, eh. but from it's a practical perspective, in, you, <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't just pretend we live in a world that doesn't work like that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. do you remember the very first star Wars movie when Luke Skywalker pulls out a grappling hook out of nowhere and he swings across that whatever it is and everyone's shooting at him. Yeah. That's the only time Luke Skywalker has a grappling hook. But you know it's been in his belt the entire <laughs> time. So just because something's in your utility belt doesn't mean that when you're fighting Darth Vader in the third film you need to grappling hook him in the face. That's yeah. my summary of what you oh, just said. that might have worked, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's got the black suit by then in one hand. and he yeah. Um, and your second piece of advice... Not quite build it and they will come, but you, yeah, you've got to you've got to act yeah. how you want to be. Yeah, if you don't treated. build it, they won't come. You know? Yeah, that yeah. I suppose that's better. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, thanks so much for your yeah. time. I really appreciate it. Um, of and yeah, thanks for having me. No, not at all, man. So I'll do the outro in a second. Uh, what are the best places for people to find you online? Uh, you do Patreon, Twitter. I, obviously, YouTube is the main place. Uh, Twelve Tone. Uh, youtube.com slash 12 tone videos um basically all the major social media platforms i have 12 tone videos yeah uh so twitter facebook we even have an instagram but i never use it sure uh honestly i will say if people are trying to find me online facebook is not a great place to do that i try yeah. and avoid that site as much as possible sure. if you want to like actually get responses from me and send messages that i will see twitter is probably the best place yeah so uh that would be if people are trying to like find where I'm actually active online, YouTube yeah. and Twitter are the main ones. Wicked. But, but yeah. And also, yes, we do have a Patreon. Yeah. But 
which is also 12 tone videos there as well you got to get in the patreon at every opportunity i've found got to man yeah <laughs> got to mention it <laughs> yeah yeah cory thanks so much dude i'll uh, yeah, i'll see you around of course Thanks again to Corey for making time to chat with me. I really enjoyed learning about his journey to where he is now, both as a musician and as a YouTube creator. I certainly got a lot out of the conversation and I hope you guys did too. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do more interviews because I have a reasonable history in journalism, mostly music, a little bit not, so I'm no stranger to doing interviews. It's not a problem it's not a stress for me to do i just want to know if it's the kind of thing that you guys would appreciate seeing more of and i can start collecting ideas of who i want to talk to who i think you guys would really get something out of hearing from i'm going to put a whole bunch of links to 12 tone stuff in the description so if you want to just scroll down and look at them you can do that if you haven't subscribed to his channel for the love of all that is holy go do that now and i will see you next friday at 4 p.m gmt see you later Thank you.